I'm Matt Hayes. I haven't got much in common with Barbara Kievsky, really. She's German and I'm English. She's a girl, I'm a boy. She's quite young and I'm, I suppose, a bit oldish. But we both share a passion for fishing. And that's why we've decided to go on the ultimate fishing road trip together to Ontario. The latest leg of our Canadian adventure saw us headed south through Lake Superior Provincial Park towards Sault Ste. Marie. But before we lost the wilds of the rugged Ontario countryside, we stopped at the sacred site at Agawa Bay on the banks of the Great Lake to discover the Ojibwe First Nation pictographs and to cast a line in the nearby river. So where do you think he is? Here on the shore of Lake Superior, there's all kinds of interesting stuff to see. And here we've got these First Nation Aboriginal pictographs, which actually depict life in a former time, but also provide evidence, of course, that Lake Superior has supported civilization for a long time. We don't know how old these pictographs are exactly. The best guess is around 1600s, but they could actually be thousands of years old and they were made by grinding down other rocks and creating a red oxide paint which has actually survived centuries at least of being weathered. Now of course if you're used to seeing cave paintings bear in mind they are sealed off from all of the harsh weather elements here on the shore of Superior. Ice, snow, wind, rain, a lake level that we know um, has certainly been higher in the past. So they've survived all of that. And the most famous one is Mishapishu. It's probably Canada's most well-known pictograph. It depicts Mishapishu, or the water spirit. Quite a popular spirit among different tribes across Canada, but of course, hugely significant here on the shores of the world's biggest lake. Clues to Lake Superior's amazing past can be seen here in this fantastic landscape where the rock has been split apart by fissures. About a billion years ago, rifting activity formed Lake Superior and some of the fissures went down as far as 90 miles into the Earth's surface. But the really interesting thing about Superior is that it shouldn't have been the world's largest lake. Rather, if the rifting had continued, it would have been an ocean. But the rifting mysteriously stopped, and of course, when the Ice Age came along, the retreating glaciers scoured out the lake, filled it with meltwater, and bingo, the world's biggest lake was formed. But it's sobering thought that actually, there was a very good chance at one time that it was gonna be just another ocean. Not far from where we saw the wonderful pictographs on Lake Superior, you've got one of the many streams and rivers that feed into the gigantic lake. Now this is the Agua River, and we've come here today to try and catch, well, anything really, a rainbow trout, a salmon or a brook trout. Brad, you're the local guide. What might we expect to catch? Well, we can expect maybe pink salmon, Chinook salmon, brook trout, and natural rainbow. So it's quite a good variety, but I've got to say, you know, these conditions, bright hot weather, low clear river, I don't think I'd even bother going salmon fishing if I was back home. Up here, we have these conditions most of the time. These rivers stay crystal clear, not quite as hot as today, but that's what the fish see all the time. Well, we're going to start off in this calmer water downstream here, just above the lake. We're going to start off with some spinning tackle and then maybe I can see one or two small riffles up there, which could be good for a little bit of fly fishing later on. Well, we're really struggling here. We knew we would in these weather conditions. You know, salmon fishing all over the world is all about the height of the river. And what you want is a good flow. And that's exactly what we haven't got. 
This water with a couple of feet on it would be absolutely perfect for fly fishing and spinning too. But it looks pretty dead right now, so Brad and I are struggling to find a place where we might get a good shot at some fish. But we're going to walk down here and see if we can find one or two deeper holes and target them with a spinner. This pool is cool, looks very nice, but I saw only two fish. They're definitely not interesting in my lure, so I will change the place for a deeper spot. Well, normally when I'm fishing for salmon, you'll never find me without a fly rod, but you've got to adapt to the conditions, and it's really unfortunate that we're here now in the absolute kiss of death conditions for salmon fishing. It doesn't matter how many fish are in the river, when the sun's blazing down like this and it's over 30 degrees and the water's so low and so clear, it really makes catching fish very, very difficult. And it's simply that the salmon become very lethargic. They much prefer an overcast day, but more than anything else, what this water needs is its lifeblood, water, and quite a lot of it. This river would be a completely different scene if it had a couple of feet of water on it. It'd be pushing through, I'd be able to fish the fly. It's a beautiful spot, this river. It's quite short and Lake Superior is only a few hundred metres down there. And if we had some water, it would probably be full of running fish. So in the circumstances, with such lifeless water, the only option I felt really was to try and spin fish. Um, and what I've been doing is working my way down the river one big pace at a time, making a cast, another pace, make a cast, another pace, make a cast. And the idea is to systematically cover the water with a spinner. Now I chose a small spinner because there's a basic rule in salmon fishing. And that is that the lower the water, the smaller the fly or the lure. So I've used a small lure, I've fished methodically. I've brought it back at different speeds. I've tried fast and slow, but unfortunately, Despite my best efforts, I haven't actually managed to catch a fish. Now, maybe things will improve as the light drops, maybe not. I always think of a river in this condition as a little bit like a sick patient. It's kind of lifeless and listless, and it's lying there feeling very sorry for itself and waiting till it gets better, basically when the rain comes. work fishing so I have here a really nice deep area and my tactic is make one cast directly to the another shore pull in and then after the cast I go in this direction one meter or so and I make the next cast well that's it I'm afraid I would love to see this beautiful river when it's in its glory with almost a metre of water pushing through it. It'd be a dream to fish then, but it's in a bit of a sorry state at the moment. I suppose it's only to be expected. It's the end of a, a dry summer and that's how it is with salmon fishing. You win some, you lose some. Aqua River I fished uh, with my spinning rod and um, spinners and I have a couple of cars with my spooner but nothing works. I see no fish inside the water, N no nothing. The water was so clear and oh, I try really my best but nothing works. Well, for the first time on our Ontario adventure, we're moving out of the wilderness 
and into the city. We're on the road now to a city called Sault Ste. Marie and there we'll be fishing under a huge bridge which actually marks the border with the United States. It's a real change of scenery for us and we're very much looking forward to it. Well, we've arrived at Sault Ste. Marie and that's the international bridge over there. Here's the rapids and as Brad actually warned us, this is Brad by the way, who's a local fishing guide, um, because the water's so high, they're releasing so much water from the dam, we can't get access to the areas that you would normally fish. So out there you've got this huge mass of rapid white water which I, which I guess would be a really good area to fish in normal conditions. But because of the conditions, everybody's reduced to fishing on this side, which looks pretty fiddly to me and very short range. And there's a lot of people fishing. So I think this is going to be very difficult uh, personally, and it will be a question of strategy. But for you, it's good news because it's all short range. We're seeing a few fish porpoise here too, so there's fish here, it's just going to be, you know, we've got to get to them. Yeah. So, we've got a really difficult set of circumstances here. We've got a bank holiday weekend, so the world and his wife's out fishing. It's a public piece of water, so there are people here throwing spinners, fishing with bait, as well as fly fishing, of course. And of course, the water out there, which would normally be much lower, is really high because they're releasing too much water from the dam. So we can't really fish the area you would normally fish, and so we're going to be reduced to fishing at close range in these small holes and pots. And for me, this is more like close range grayling fishing than it is salmon fishing. It's going to be pretty tricky, I think. And, um, to be perfectly honest, I think it's going to be tough. Oh, I like this place. Uh, it's similar to Ireland. I have a little bit experience in that. So I must not cast so far away. I can't fish directly in front of my feet. And I know the fish is inside the water. Using the fly rod is for me, um, uh, yeah, I do it, of course. But if you like to have a fish from me, I must use a spinning rod. But I try to fish one fish with a fly rod. Well, I've just been out for my first fishing experience at Sault Ste. Marie with Brad, who's one of the local guides. He's quite a character, actually. And he certainly knows the water, and you need a guy like this, because actually, the wading out there was pretty slippery at times, and uh, you really need to know your way around these treacherous little runs and riffles. They suddenly drop away into deep holes. The salmon fishing itself is not classic salmon fishing for me which involves putting out quite a long line and just letting the fly come round but in its own way it's quite technical um, you don't need a lot of casting skill to fish here to be perfectly honest very short range fishing but where you do need to think about it is how the fly presents to the fish in all these twisting and turning currents because if they catch the line in the wrong way they literally pull the fly through the water at a completely unnatural angle and speed and these fish are not stupid. They want the fly to come at them the right way. So you need to be thinking all the time about mending the line, putting a little upstream and downstream mends in it, just to control the fly and pick the line of your drift also. So whereas it's not really classic salmon fishing with the water at this level, it's certainly interesting. And it's all about picking pockets. Of course, you could go out there and get a lucky fish. Of course you could. 
And the nice thing about fishing here is you don't have to be by any means an expert fly fisher. But I think if you've got experience of other forms of fly fishing, notably wild trout and grayling, it does help you in this situation. So we didn't catch a fish, but we explored the water. We gave it a nice lash. It's been really hot today, so this was the right time of day to fish. Tomorrow's gonna to be hot again. I'd certainly like a crack at the rapids. It looks pretty formidable out there, but Brad's promised me a go at that tomorrow and something to really get my teeth into. Well, you know, I don't think I've ever fished right in the middle of a city like this before. I've fished in Ireland a couple of times, but this is quite a big city. It's got a population of 100,000 people, huge bridges. The USA is just next door, got loads of people, high-rise buildings, the whole lot. Actually, it's a pretty cool scene. I'd love to catch a salmon here. I'm here on the St. Marie Rapids. I have my spinning rod with me and a perfect lure. It's called Flying Sea. Um, right behind me, there's a big stone. I will sit on that, and directly in the front of the stone is a deep hole. Hopefully, one or two fish are there and wait for me. I have my lucky stone with me. I try my best now. Well, all fishing requires an action plan, and I'm gonna to stick to mine. I'm down here in the city now, in the outflow from the dam, in the rapids, and there's a lot of people around, that's for sure. Here in North America, in Canada, they really don't mind fishing shoulder to shoulder. And to us Europeans, that's a bit of a shock. We like lots and lots of space, but I'm not gonna get it. I'm gonna to have to find a spot that looks good and work my way through it. I've got two rods set up. I've got a single hand fly rod with what we call nymphs on it, and I've got a double hand fly rod that will get me more distance if I can just make it out to the wall on the other side. It's going to be knit one, pearl two in terms of getting some space, but hey, you've got to be in it to win it. So I'm going to go in, pitch myself in there and muscle a few of the locals out of the way. Again. Yeah, there's a fish, I got a fish. Oh, I got two chances, two fish contacts. What a day. I make millions of cast. I had a for, for five seconds, I have fish on my lure, so um, I, tomorrow I will come back with the right lure and try it again. But before I go, five cars more. Well, Matt and I, we were out onto the wall here and uh, it, it, it's tough, it's really tough. Um, he, he fished swinging, he fished nymphing, dead drifting, swinging some nymphs. The fish, are, the fish are there. They're just, they're just not active. The water is, is, is warm. There's too much water. And, and Matt did an awesome job out there. Well, more often than not, salmon fishing is about what you don't catch. That's if you fly fish for them. And I've really enjoyed the fishing here this evening. It's been pretty tough. The high water, has caused a real big problem because actually I'm fishing in the areas that normally you'd be standing on. 
and that means it's very close range, fiddly, kind of picking pockets really, just fishing in among the boulders and stuff. And fishing with a style that I would normally use back at home for a species of fish called grayling. Very short line, just bumping nymphs across the bottom. Certainly not the classic salmon fishing style. It's so quick at the moment and the water's so high that the fish are probably not comfortable being there. But it was nice to get the two amp fly rod out and put out a nice line. And then come back in and try a little bit more nymph fishing. It is quite technical, very close range stuff and it requires a lot of work, but I'm not beaten. I feel that I'd like another crack at it. It's interesting, amazing backdrop. United States of America is just over there, you know. Anyway, it's been fun. I've always been fascinated by different cultures and particularly the First Nation Aboriginal culture. And as important as fishing is to me, I've now got the opportunity to meet a real life chief and go to my first powwow. So even though the fishing's really tricky, I'm afraid it's gonna to have to wait because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. So Chief, I'm not actually quite sure how I should address you. Can you, can you inform me? My indigenous name is Nimnagojin Gwayakasid, or Giman Nimnagojin Gwayakasid, which is the chief that flies with tilted wing and stands tall and proud for the people. Gosh. But you can call me Chief. Well, look, it's a real privilege to be fishing on your land. And I'm conscious that there's a lot of history here. So, can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, well, if you look around the island, you'll see that there aren't very old trees here. And um, I guess we paid the ultimate price as a people with industrialization in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, when uh, there was this quest, there was this mission to industrialize and really do major extraction of natural resources in the area. And we'd always managed uh, in, in harmony with the environment all of those relationships with all our relatives. And I say our relatives, I mean the fish, the animals, the plants, the trees, they're all, we're all related. We all are part of the same family and we all have an obligation to protect them and look after them, just like you or I look after each other. We have to be conscious of the spirit and everything around us. Okay, so we've got to check at history, but let's talk about the future, hope, preservation of a culture. What's your plan, Chief? Well, I think it's really important for, for us to note that the indigenous people of this area are really resilient. So we're going to be having oh, a whole slew of different types of natural resource related ceremonies in the next little while, including today. Uh, we will be having a powwow, and, and a powwow is a, a cultural gathering for us. It's, a, it's a, probably one of our biggest gatherings. So are the, are the powwows open to everyone? Can I go, for example? Oh yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's open to a powwow. Historically, the way things were was that all colors, all races were welcome in our ceremonies. For a time, it was illegal for us to have our ceremonies. And we ended up having to do our ceremonies in the bush and hide, so it became secret ceremonies. But they're not secret ceremonies, they're sacred ceremonies, they're open to everybody. So we, we love the opportunity to educate people and, and understand their perspectives too. So it's a, it's a cross-cultural uh, celebration and uh, we love having people from around the world to come and celebrate with us and have a little taste of our culture, a little bit of taste of our food and you know just enjoy our spirituality and our, our traditions, yeah. And the music started. Are you excited? I'm really excited. Let's go get them. Yeah. As a fly tyer, I'm absolutely fascinated by all of these wonderful feathers. And I can't help thinking, beautiful as these things are, they are 
a waste of a good feather. Okay. The sense of community is absolutely amazing here. But more importantly than that, you can really feel the energy and the atmosphere. It's, it's very, very special and uh, fantastic scene. We're going on to White Frost. What you don't realise when you're watching this is how hot it is out here. It's well over 30 degrees. The humidity is through the roof, but it's not stopping any of these folks. They're having a great time and it's really touching. Amazing event actually. Very moving. But I don't think I'll be dancing just yet. from the neighboring community, First Nation Ojibwe community I'm from Garden River, which is about 10 miles east of here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, and this is the Power Weekend, and I love the Power Weekend. Oh, it's, it's magic. Well, I've never been to one before, but it's really intoxicating. It Amazing is. event, actually. I'm glad you enjoy it. Oh, I'm loving it. Awesome. I'm loving it. It's nice to great meet you, to you too. Thank you for the first oh, life. you're very welcome. Oni. Yeah. Oni. Thank you. Oni in Ojibwe is hello, so Oni. Oni. Yeah. Yeah, and I was told that I told that we mustn't say goodbye. That and that's what it means. There's no word for goodbye. Okay. But miigwech is is thank you from me the bottom gwech. of my heart. So uh, well, the pleasure was all mine. Uh -huh. oh. Thank you. I always see women blushing when they're talking to Dean Sayers. Well, I love this old teepee. It's totally authentic and it's really weathered. It looks like the real deal to me. And in fact, I've been having a chat with its custodian, Mike, and he's filled me in on what goes on in here. And basically, it's a great place to go in. There's a fire inside, which we can't film because there are spirits contained in the fire. We can film inside, but not the fire. And basically, I'm gonna go in there. I'm gonna pick up a handful of tobacco, a handful of cedar, I'm gonna walk around the fire clockwise, say a prayer to the creator. I can wish for anything. I can wish for a great day today. Me, I'm gonna pray for my family. Say megeti, which means thank you. And then maybe if I'm lucky, Mike might do a bit of smudging, which is basically a, a cleansing with smoke and with the wing of an eagle. So quite spiritual stuff, I'm looking forward to it. And this is how how we, how we get cleansed. So you're gonna, you're gonna smudge me, that's that's the... Yeah, okay. uh, just how we get cleansed. Okay. So, uh, just like you're gonna wash your face. Yeah. That's what you so do, do with, I breathe with your hands. This, do I breathe this in, Mike, or do I just... A little bit, not much. Okay. Because it also will clean out your inside too, eh? Okay. So just like you're washing your face. It's quite a strong smell. You know, the like What is it? Like okay. This. Oh, good, okay. Right, okay. Just like you're washing your face. And this is how we cleanse ourselves. Usually we, we do this every morning. So we start our, our day out fresh. And you can turn around and I'll get your back. Okay. You okay? Yeah, I'm huh? okay. <laughs> Do you find it a bit emotional or? Yeah, you uh, told me why. Yes. Yeah. Because you've been cleaned by the spirits. I'm now really clean. P people back at home might find this strange, but actually, this is a very, very emotionally charged event, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It's quite powerful. You'd be surprised. I've really enjoyed doing this. Oh, we've yeah. we've sacrificed a lot of fishing time, but every part of it has been absolutely worth it. It's quite remarkable. I've really enjoyed it. Me too.
Well, after the powwow, we've got about an hour's fishing time left tonight, but on a day when it's been well into the 30s and really humid, that's probably not a bad thing. We're coming out at the right time. And then tomorrow, I'm gonna to go out on the boat with Brad. Babs is gonna fish off the shore. So between the two of us, I'm hoping that we're gonna hit it lucky and catch a nice fish. Well, not easy casting conditions out here. I've got a really strong wind coming into my face and into the, my normal casting shoulder, so I've got to swap arms. But it's an amazing feeling to be fishing under this huge bridge. It's just incredible, really, to think there are salmon here. Of course, they weren't here many, many years ago. They were introduced into Lake Superior And they've behaved <laughs> pretty much like regular salmon, migrating into rapid water to spawn out of Superior, which, let's face it, it is like an ocean anyway. It's huge. It's like a sea. Well, look at this. <laughs> now I'm fishing right underneath the bridge. And above me, in the distance, you can see the USA. The water here is crystal clear. Some big stones out here. Just the sort of place that salmon like. And uh, yeah, it, it feels great, this. I made a, a run down here, taking a step between each cast to try and cover the water and changing the casting angles. If I put the fly out more square, exactly opposite, I get more speed on the fly as it comes round. If I cast it shallower, I can slow it down. And I've tried plenty of different casting angles. Maybe I should now try a change of fly. Bizarre fishing scene this. There's a huge train rumbling across that bridge behind me. And I can hardly hear myself. I'm right here in the middle of the city with all this wonderful racing water. And it's a very evocative fishing scene this actually. So this is the last day, the last chance for me to get a big salmon. Um, I woke up very early in the morning. I will start very early with the fishing. Matt is still sleeping in the hotel and I want to fish the whole day. So hard work, a uh, hard bait doesn't work. I fish not deep enough, so I change now to a soft lure with a jig head, it's 10 gram. Uh, so I can fish now more in the ground.
so it doesn't work with soft lures and hard baits on this place. Um, I change now my tactic. I fish now uh, with a floater and a little tiny fly right there on the stone. I will sit on the stone, I'll stand on the stone and behind the stone is a deep hole. Hopefully the fish is there and they like my fly. I was just thinking, you know, that if we, if we really stick to this nymph fishing, because we haven't had a real run at it yet, just a few hours fishing, you know these runs, so I thought that was better maybe than going out in the boat to, to really concentrate on these runs that you know. And you know, I, I, I'd rather catch them from the shore than in the boat. You know that anyway, yeah. so you know, that's... So this is really all about precision, searching the water, combing the bottom, and we've got to work our way in among all the other people that are fishing here. That's an additional complication, but the idea really is to just search the riverbed with the flies and literally try and pop one of the flies into a fish's mouth and give it no choice. a really great current in front of me and I throw out my my swim my swimmer and the swimmer drift inside the current in this direction oh I think I got a bite what's that there's two beat for stone oh I got a I I got the first bite This makes me really, really, really crazy. So um, with the sunshine, I can see all the fish in the water. They, are, they stand, I don't know, maybe five or six salmon directly in the deep water. And they swim around. They are here. <laughs> now, it's very difficult to find the right lure, the right hard bait or This is so exciting. Fishing can be a struggle sometimes, but when the struggle pays off, it's a really, really sweet feeling. I made the call not to go out in the boat today with Brad because I wanted to catch a fish on the fly fishing from the shore. And it looked pretty hopeless initially because there were so many people fishing down here. But then one of Brad's fellow guides, young Adam, came along. He'd been fishing further down the river and he'd found a few shoals of fish, importantly, that hadn't been fished over by the holiday crowds. Of course, Good fishing often involves a bit of a struggle and it was difficult just to get to the place. So we had to walk through dense cover, negotiate a marshy path, and then eventually we got down to the water's edge and then we had to wade across the river, quite a strong current, until we got onto an island. Adam straight away pointed out to me a nice shoal of pink salmon. And the good news is that the tactics that I used eventually paid off. The fishing was really tricky. It's short line fishing with heavy nymphs, and you might think, well, that sounds easy. But these fish would only take the fly if you literally hit them on the nose with it. The water's fast, and it's really difficult to get the presentation right. But thankfully, I got that one killer drift where, actually, I thought I'd hooked a rock for the umpteenth time, and then suddenly, as I lifted the rod, the rock came to life, and a really strong fish shot out across the current. It was my first pink salmon and I was actually absolutely delighted with it. A really stocky, chunky little fish, not like the torpedo-shaped Atlantic silver salmon that we're used to seeing, but a much shorter, stockier fish, 
but still with very nice colours and body profile. A male fish in good condition. And, you know, it was a really, really good fight, I've got to say. I also hooked a couple of other fish, one that just wriggled off after a few seconds and another one that actually smashed my line when it went over a rock. So after the huge epic struggle, thanks to Adam, it all came good for me this afternoon. I thought, to be honest, that Babs would beat me to it because she's chosen the much easier method of spinning for the fish, but I know that she hasn't had anything so far. I'm just hoping that on the evening session, she'll get her chance too. I really, 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 I really try my best. Well, we took a break after the first fish. It was really boiling hot unbelievably humid and an hour off was definitely the thing to do but then as I was sitting down sort of staring at the water I started to see fish splashing around and I realized that fish that had previously been lethargic had suddenly become active so Adam and I headed out again we waded across the river we found a really nice little run and just worked down it methodically and it was one of those occasions with the pressure being off I'd caught the first fish I knew I was going to get another one and it didn't take long before I did. And it was a beautiful fish, quite high contrast in its colours, but once again, a super fight. These pink salmon in this strong current on a light fly rod really do go. They're very strong, very determined. They jump and twist and turn. And watching the fish fight in that crystal clear water so you can just see it twisting and turning, it's really, really exciting. It's pretty tricky landing them in that stiff current right underneath your feet. But thankfully, we eventually managed to scoop the fish up in the net and get a good look on it. When I look back on the trip, the things that will be burnt into my memory are that huge bridge, the international bridge behind me. And the very technical nature of the pockets of water that I had to fish, the absolute precision with which you have to present weighted flies. It looks really easy from a distance, but just casting those things and getting them to land in the right place is tricky. But I had great help. Brad's a terrific character. He knows the water like the back of his hand. He's been really committed to helping me. And then today, for young Adam to come along, he's a really nice lad. He's got good eyes. He's got a great attitude and he's got a really good future in fishing guiding, of that I'm sure. So, with a little bit of help from my friends, I cracked it. Well, Babs, gosh. That was hard work. How oh, did you get yeah. on? No, I had one one bite. A re this was a really huge one. I have in ten seconds, and then the line broken. Oh. It was a wonderful moment. Really good for me. But you know that salmon fishing. Sometimes you are the duck, and sometimes you are the tree. Well, you're right about that. Well, I managed to catch a couple of pink salmon. Oh, really? That's yeah, good. and I got them on fly, so I'm really pleased about that. Uh, but yeah, it was great and I mean such a cool experience fishing right by that international bridge I and mean, it's yeah. a pretty special place but Absolutely. there is no rest for the wicked because now we've got to move on yeah. and we're going on to a place called the French River. So, right. yeah. no time to waste girl, okay. let's go. Okay. If there's one thing 
I've learned about trying to catch salmon is that the pieces of the fishing jigsaw all have to be in place. Otherwise, it can be an impossible challenge. The heat and low water levels work against us. Yet I still hooked a big fish, but it managed to escape. Thankfully, Matt was able to catch a few on the fly and we left Sue Saint-Marie as a successful team. I can't wait to get back, to meet the many friends I make and to try for the legendary runs of Saint-Marie.